and welcome to episode 17 of What to Think, the best internet blogocast available today. Brought to you by VentureBeat and our host and sponsor, New Relic. I am Jolie O'Dell, VentureBeat's managing editor. And I'm Jordan Ovet, staff writer here at VentureBeat. And we are going to talk about the hottest news off VentureBeat in the past week, as well as talk with uh, Diego Oppenheimer. What a great name. Yes, it is. Uh, you'll be hearing what he sounds like in a few minutes. Um, he's the co-founder and CEO of Algorithmia. Uh, they have developed an app store for algorithms. Just wait till you hear how people use it and what kind of algorithms there are and all sorts of fun stuff. See, with a name like Diego Oppenheimer, I kind of just want him to be some international spy. He's not, actually. You can ask him about <laughs> his bio later. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyways, let's let's talk about some of the stories uh, that we broke this week on VentureBeat.com, Internet's best news website. The first one is about consumer health. I'm not really a health advocate. I, <laughs> I prefer junk food and low-lying infections. Well, that's okay, because people have to suffer the consequences of what they eat. So you're only going to be paying for that. No, I'm not calling you fat. That is the oldest trick in the book. You fell right into it. So (laughs) damn. this week, Jordan Novak calls Julie O'Dell fat. Hilarity ensues. What's up with the Fitbit, though? Okay. People thought that consumer health platforms that Google, Apple, and Samsung were building would be cloud repositories for health and biometrics information that wearables were uh, generating, like a Fitbit or a Jawbone, uh, other wearable devices. Mm -hmm. Um, And actually, you know, people thought that the Apple Health Kit and the Google Fit uh, apps would be able to store and share uh, health data sets um, in a cool way, not just so that you can like swipe through all your steps. But uh, what we found out is that people in the medical device and digital health and healthcare industries um, were saying that most doctors have little time for uh, or interest in actually using that wellness data from those wearable devices. It's not yeah. like it's medical grade, so to speak. They don't want to spend money on additional systems. And most of all, they don't want to worry about keeping the data private. Oh, yeah. It's a huge compliance issue. And also, if I'm your doctor, do I care how many steps you took today unless that's part of my regimen for you? No, I don't care. Okay, so my thing that I have been um, bouncing off of people in the past few days is, what if I take my Fitbit and I just shake it around a lot in such a way that it makes it look like I am working out when actually I am not. You're like a little kid holding the thermometer up to the light bulb to make mom think he has a fever. The point is, this is maybe not the most valuable data set, even though we all thought that this is going to be great for our health. Um, so one of our sources told us, it's just one more data set they have to deal with, and they're already wrestling with lots of data every day. So who gives Sounds a crap about like the data? Sounds like a big data problem. It's not a big data problem because they don't want to even integrate that kind of data. Because they already have too much data. Doctors are busy people. Don't waggle your Fitbit at them. <laughs> Leave them alone. So let's move forward. Remember Hugo Barra? Yeah, I He do. is the coolest. He was uh, VP of Android at Google. Yeah, um, I had a big man crush on him. He just had the most fascinating th- things to say at Google I.O. Well, um, last year he went from Google to, am I saying it right, Xiaomi? Xiaomi. You uh, said it right. And yeah. that is where he went. And it was fascinating, too. That whole story, there was drama. Mm-hmm. Not to get to morning talk show radio on you. but What, yeah, what happened? Oh, it was something that he and, and uh, Sergey Brin were dating the same girl. Oh, boy. And there was a breakup, and he had to flee the country because he was heartbroken. Uh-huh. That was the tabloid version of the drama. I don't know anything about the situation. And this is not endorsed by VentureBeat. But that was the drama. <laughs> Anyways, um, Hugo I- went to Xiaomi. Right. And then Baidu snatched up Google's Andrew Ng, who was behind all the deep learning stuff, right? That's right. At Google? Yes. Right. And last week, Jane Penner, she was uh, doing Google's investor relations stuff, which is very important when you're going to IPO. She went over to Alibaba, who mm-hmm. is doing an IPO, right? Mm-hmm. They didn't already do it. They're, it's coming up still. I'm not so much in the loop. They, d- they did file for their IPO, actually. So in one year, that's three marquee-level executives going from Google to these big powerhouse companies in China. Mm-hmm. What's up with that? We 
ascertain that it is almost certainly not just involving relationships. But if these companies want to get seriously into America, they can use the people who already have vast you know, contact lists and experience working with uh, the kinds of companies and individual consumers here in this country that these Chinese companies would want to access. But also, we dug up this interesting you know, notion that it's boring right now at Google. That's the latest word on the street from our no. reporter, Ruth Reeder, who had this article, that it's just not as exciting. And so I actually got a chance to inter in interview Andrew Ng, who is now at Baidu, like you said. And he's like, you know, where I can pursue the AI mission and advance that mission is not at Google, it's at Baidu. He talked about being able to spin up lots of uh, cloud infrastructure really quickly, you know, maybe much more quickly than he was able to at Google before uh, he had to go through meetings with committees. And now it's like when he says something, it happens super quick. That way of moving quickly, um, that excitement about going to America, you know, scaling across America, that's what's getting these people going. So that's the uh, narrative that we're drawing here. And I think, you know, three marks a trend, as we always like to say. So it's worthy of our pontification about this. I like it. Okay, so here's what to think for this week. One, Google is boring. B, your doctor don't care about your Fitbit. <laughs> okay, that's all the time we've got for the news. For more, <laughs> all this and much, much more, you know where to go, VentureBeat.com. We'd like to offer a quick shout out to our host and sponsor, software analytics maker New Relic. New Relic makes sense of billions of metrics across millions of web and mobile apps to help the people who build modern software understand the stories their data is trying to tell them. New Relic's products, which support PHP, Python, Ruby, Java, .NET, Node, iOS, and Android apps, help improve software performance and reliability to provide a better experience for users and more success for your business. And now, it is the non-international spy founder with the very cool name, Diego Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer? Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer, sir. It is very good to have you on today's episode of What to Think. Um, so tell me a little bit about yourself and Algorithmia. What's your deal, man? Okay. <laughs> um, so I actually grew up in uh, South America in Uruguay, uh, came to the U.S., uh, about uh, 12 years ago, where I met my co-founder, Kenny, in uh, college at Carnegie Mellon. Um, we kind of always started talking about, um, you know, our general interest in computation and computation markets. Um, this is a big part of uh, what my co-founder, Kenny, studied. Uh, he went on to do his PhD in artificial intelligence over at USC. Um, and it was while I was there, and I was over in Microsoft, uh, I worked on the Excel team in Microsoft doing uh all the data analysis tools um, in Excel were, were part of the stuff that I was designing. Well, uh, he was at USC and I was at Microsoft. We kind of started seeing like the problem with, uh, you know, academics trying to publish what they, uh, you know, what they were working on and get the work distributed. Um, and the best thing that they could hope for was getting published in a journal, getting a couple of citations. And that was kind of like the hurrah of like, yeah, you're going to get, you know, you're going to get tenure, you're going to get published. This is, they're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. Um, but that really wasn't enough, especially for Kenny and his colleagues. They wanted their meaningful work to be used by the world. They saw, like, real benefit in what they were building and how other people can integrate those algorithms, those advanced algorithms into their work. Um, so it was really frustrating for them. On the flip side, I was over at Microsoft, and we were always looking for, like, the best and latest algorithms to use uh, to apply to data analysis. We were kind of lucky that we had a $7 billion research center in Microsoft Research to go tap into. Uh, and so we would go and we would ask people there, hey, are you guys working on, on anything like of, uh, what we're looking for? Um, I would get a response a couple of weeks or months later, and they'd be like, yeah, doctor, you know, blah, 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 is in like a basement in Cambridge <laughs> and he's working on something that would interest you. Mm -hmm. And so you'd go talk to him, and he'd be like, oh, yeah, I've been working on this exact type of algorithm that you want for the last six years. Uh, oh, and it's directly in Excel, by the way. Hmm. And this is kind of like shocking realization at that point where you see that, you know, even in a company like Microsoft that has like a really, really good path from research to product, like it's failing. And so imagine how that happens at scale and how much knowledge is kind of like locked up 
across the globe. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a great kind of story leading up to it. But Diego, one thing that we were just talking about before we got on with you is how often do does an algorithm that exists end up matching up with like a whole bunch of other people's um, challenges and projects? Um, you want to build this marketplace or app store for algorithms to all live, I guess. That's the way that I think about it. They're all living on one little, one big thing uh, for people to use. And uh, I'm just wondering, actually, Jolie ha has even stronger desire to get an answer to this question. <laughs> How is one single algorithm going to answer like a, a crap load of problems? Yeah. So, um, well, so, you know, like we can start about like so a field that's been like really hot lately, right? Something like machine learning, mm -hmm. um, especially like text analysis. Mm -hmm. So this problem that like a lot of people have, right? Like, how do I interpret topics out of large amounts of text? Like what with all the you know, news feeds I have? Like, how do I can extract topics from those without reading it? Because it's just not, doesn't scale anymore at the human level. Like, you do need machines to assist you in this. So those type of algorithms are the ones that, like, are really good in our system because we can make those topic analysis algorithms available. And now, you know, multiple people can apply, you know, whatever their text sources are to mm -hmm. get uh, that working. So the, the actual area of text analysis is, like, a really big one uh, for us. Computer vision, right? Like, we're mm -hmm. talking about... Everything from, like, think about how, like, Facebook tag says, oh, there's probably a person here. You want to tag them. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, they, you recognize faces all the way to, you know, wine companies like uh, Delectable. I don't know if you've heard of, like, the wine app. Like, uh, no. you can take a picture of the wine, and it recognizes the wine you're using. These are all the types of algorithms, these kind of advanced algorithms that can be used by multiple companies all at once. And the kind of like state of the art research isn't just, isn't just not getting to them, right? And they, they need an easy way to consume these because the application developers are different from the algorithm developers. The application developers know how to integrate services into their applications versus going out and developing these algorithms from scratch. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that one single algorithm can get, you know, usage across different types, like whether it's text or pictures or videos? I just want to make sure I understand that part right. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we're already seeing that. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, one type of algorithm can be used for multiple different purposes. So um, another example I can give you is, uh, you know, think if you think about path planning algorithms. You path can use planning? Wait, I don't know well. what that is. What, what is it? So path planning, think, uh, you, know, you know how Google figures out how do you get between A and B on Google Maps? Mm -hmm. That's the path planning algorithm, right? Okay. Um, how when we, you know, when we sent the Mars rover, uh, you know, to Mars, and it's driving by itself. It's figuring out a path uh -huh. on itself. Like, those are algorithms that are being used so it can figure out how to navigate, um, you know, across Mars. Mm -hmm. Those types of algorithms have applications across, you know, have multiple applications, everything from autonomous vehicles to autonomous drones to figuring out, you know, where the FedEx trucks should be going. Like, you can definitely use those types of algorithms and kind of recycle them over. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's a fire customization, but in a lot of times their generic form can work for multiple applications and purposes. Now, my concern is also, um, I think it's amazing that you are making these things available and kind of creating a marketplace for that. It's funny because when you talk about image recognition or text analysis, you're getting into territory that a lot of companies would consider their own personal competitive advantage. What happens when, um, you know, you kind of, you develop algorithms that are better than theirs, if that would ever happen, or if it's open sourced, if contributors contribute and make a much better, more powerful algorithm than the one, say, Facebook uses to recognize your aunt in horrible pictures. <laughs> Well, that's absolutely what we're hoping for, right? Um, so, you know, when we think about, so right now, those type of advanced algorithms, the usage of those advanced algorithms have been limited to the companies who can afford to host an army of algorithm developers in-house. Mm -hmm. And it's really not that big of a group of, you know, companies, if you think about it. These are like the Facebooks, the Microsofts, the Googles of the world, but it doesn't, you know, Amazon uh, comes to mind, like it doesn't really go beyond mm -hmm. those companies. Mm -hmm. it, actual usage of this, like, you can see how, like, any mobile application could use, uh, you know, better image recognition or better, uh, you know, the advantage of democratizing that is huge, right? Like, we can, we can just get smarter applications across the board um, if we can make that available for anybody who wants to, to integrate it. How are you making a business out of that in particular? Is it all open sure. source or are you charging licensing fees or what? We host the code and we deploy it to our compute clusters. So what we do is we sell 
a subscription service to our API. Um, so you can kind of buy it and API, NPI hits. And out of that, you know, we take out a fee, which is what covers our computation costs. Um, and then the rest goes to the original algorithm developer. So there's a strong incentive for making your work available. Mm -hmm. That said, we actually do encourage open source because just because it's hosted on our platform and available on our platform doesn't mean that the code can't be made available open source as well. Um, and we highly encourage that. We, we are very strong believers in contribution and getting, you know, a community around algorithm development to unlock all this, you know, hidden knowledge that exists across the globe. You know, I can actually see um, some pretty surprising developer-focused companies like a GitHub or a Facebook even coming out of the woodwork and saying, hey, we have this cool algorithm for something that's not to our competitive advantage. Let's put it out there and see what happens with it. Have you talked with those folks? We haven't talked to GitHub or, uh, or, or Facebook, although we would welcome calls from them any day. What we have seen is algorithm consultants who have made, you know, a life, you know, a life out of their, you know, they usually hold companies and they have libraries of algorithms just reaching out to us and saying, hey, we have a bunch of this IP that we don't really have a good distribution method for. And like, we're really interested in your marketplace and see if we can host our work there. Um, and that's definitely part of our, you know, you know part, of, part of what our offering is. You know, we really want to be able to help these people distribute their work. Um, that said, I absolutely agree with you. I think there is a scenario there where you know, these companies could come in and say, hey, you know, we do have these algorithms. Why wouldn't we put them on this? On this? You know, we hope they want to contribute to this platform in the same way that we hope they use it as well. Mm -hmm. I have one last question, and it is more of the business side question. Thinking about what you do and what your very ambitious goals are. I mean, we're talking Mars, buddy. <laughs> So what do you do when Google comes along and says, you know, I love, we love what you're doing. We want to buy it. We want this to be part of Google's many, many code projects. Um, what, what are your exit plans if something like that should happen? So we have very ambitious, very ambitious plans for our company. What we want to really do is we believe that crowdsourcing the knowledge of the world is going to allow us to build an intelligence library. Um, the way we refer to it, we say it's a different approach to artificial intelligence, where every little algorithm solves a little problem, put them together, solves a lot of problems, and that's what we really want to build. If Google wants to come around later on and like a bias, I think it, you know it would have to depend on like what what, what we're talking about at that moment. Uh, but right now, we're really set on democratizing uh, access to this so that the whole world has it, and uh, we're not sure if you know Google's really good about their open source and sharing with the world. So we would have to see, you know, really what it is. We wouldn't, we wouldn't want, really want to take this privately. Google's pretty good at open sourcing a lot of stuff that isn't, you know, their infrastructure. But I don't know. It seems like Google might be a good fit. I'll call them for you later. <laughs> and uh, yeah, just... That sounds, sounds good. I'm just kidding. I can't do that for you at Google. Anywhere else, but not Google. <laughs> I've burned people there. Too many times. What am I even talking about? You had a legitimate question for this party Yeah, monster. actually, Diego, I, I do want to ask you something that doesn't involve an acquisition by Google. And that is, um, I was on Airbnb the other day. I'm not going to tell you where I wanted to go. Tell me. Um, uh, tell me. Uh, I had tell to go me. to a wedding in Detroit. Um, Ew. So, anyway. What kind of a failure of a lifetime are you planning for to get married in Detroit? It's not my wedding. It's a relative's wedding. Thanks for blowing cover. Muzzle okay, whatever. Um, so anyway, um, Diego, when I was there, Airbnb was like, oh, look at this. You can go wine. You can go to wine country or you can go to all these other cool destinations that aren't Detroit, that aren't Detroit. Right. <laughs> and it's like, why, Jordan, you've gone to such cool places before. I don't know why you're going to Detroit. Here's, you know, let me show you a few other places. It's like, girl, are you sure? Are you sure? <laughs> so this is, you know, as, as much as it's a different kind, it is a marketplace um, of places where you can stay. And um, what it does, I'm sure if Airbnb is smart, and I know they have smart data scientists and engineers, they'll surface places that have like great reviews and uh, a lot of people who are using it. And so uh, there is this concept of like showing people the best stuff. Are you going to showcase the algorithms that have been used across the board for different kinds of applications or the ones that get five star reviews, you know, in this notion of an app store? How are you going to differentiate the crap from the most awesome ones? Absolutely. Absolutely. We actually already showcase the top algorithms uh, today in our platform. Um, and so I, th I think you, you, you nailed it right there. You know, uh, any marketplace is really about putting together supply and demand in one place. And, you know, as, well, the way that we do that, you know, and is 
as we see how the different algorithms are getting used and we track the usage of all the different algorithms, we also understand how people are calling the algorithms with other ones, right? Because one of the great things about Algorithmia is that you can call any algorithm with an, you know, from another algorithm. Mm-hmm. Right? So you can create these kind of combinations. Um, and we track that in the sense of, so we understand how people are using it. So not only do we have the ability of showcasing what the best algorithms are, we can also kind of recommend Amazon style and say, hey, by the way, people who've combined, like, <laughs> I see your YouTube algorithms, people who combine these two have combined this two with a third thing. Is this something that interests you? Um, we also categorize, we have a taxonomy around what the different algorithms are. Mm-hmm. Um, so we show you showcase this. So it's really about helping the application developer build out this like intelligence pipeline for their application. That's really what we want to do. We want to help them kind of make the smartest app they can. That's really interesting to me. So you spend less time dickering over what technology you're going to use and how you're going to implement it and how many times it's going to fail and and how much you overpay your engineers and just focus on making cool shit. That's the goal. What's the next step? What do you do next other than, you know, have awesome recommendations for algorithms? Well, from a company's perspective, we're hiring, right? So that's the number one thing that, you know, we do next is uh, build out our engineering team. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of really exciting positions. Uh Um, Blowing the library, right? So that's one of the things. So we're now we're working on partnerships with top universities. Um, wow. We are lucky enough. One of our investors uh, is Oren Etzioni, who's a renowned. He's the CEO of the All Out Institute for Artificial Intelligence. Um, they have a huge catalog of algorithms that we're going to slowly start integrating onto our platform. Um, and mm-hmm. so really getting those partnerships together and, and talking to those institutions and say, hey, we're the place to share your work. We're the mm-hmm. place for you to make available your work. Um, that's really, you know, our goal. So, you know, hiring and that is like what we'll be doing for the next couple months. Okay. Well, we're going to have to uh, stay close to what you guys are up to. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, how, how uh, people start using it. I think it's a really big, really exciting play. And I, I too, I can't wait to see what the future looks like for you and what you end up doing and who ends up buying you because you know that's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> If I were well, GitHub, I, I would snap awesome. that up. <laughs> <laughs> it does make sense. All right, Diego, it was really wonderful chatting with you. Thanks for being on What to Think. Thanks a lot for uh, talking with us, Diego. Thank you very much for having us. Really appreciate it. Take yeah. care now. Catch you later. Oh, long-suffering listeners, we have come to the end of yet another episode of What to Think. I'm Jolie O'Dell, Managing Editor of VentureBeat.com. And I'm Jordan Novet, a writer. And we thank again New Relic, our hosts and sponsors. We will talk to you again next week. Tune in for What to Think. Hasta luego. Hasta la pasta. Hasta la pasta.